Amen. I'm going to ask that you would stand with me in reverence to the reading of God's holy word. It can be found in the book of Acts, chapter 23, verses 1 through 11. Acts chapter 23, verses 1 through 11. The New International Version says, Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. Those who were standing near Paul said, how dare you insult God's high priest? Paul replied, brothers, I do not, did not realize that he was the high priest, for it is written, do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the others Pharisees, he called out in the Sanhedrin, my brothers, I am a Pharisee, descended from Pharisees. I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees say that there is no resurrection and that there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees believe all these things. So there was a great uproar, and some of the teachers of the law who were Pharisees stood up and argued vigorously, we find nothing wrong with this man, they said. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them, so he ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God for his word. You may be seated. And I'd like to tag this particular text and this message for these brief moments of sharing that we have together with the title, Just Keep Living. Just Keep Living. Life has a unique and creative way of refocusing and redirecting our attention. Consistently, we are confronted with challenges and considerations that can cause us to question who we are and what we really believe. One of the most disconcerting challenges comes when people question our integrity, our motivations, or our character. Anybody ever had your integrity called into question, your character called into question? When we are subjected to misguided and ill-conceived attacks on our character, particularly when they come from people that we thought we knew and we thought knew us, it can be devastating, debilitating, draining, disheartening, depleting, and devitalizing in a real sense it can really mess us up. We're, and I'm not talking about when you know you've been unforgiving and arrogant or haughty or salacious or hypocritical or duplicitous or insincere. I'm not talking about when you are intentionally or unapologetically mean, manipulative, or marginalizing. That gives people good reason to question your integrity and your sincerity. But when you're giving your best effort, providing your most gallant service, apologizing for your missteps and mistakes, and striving to lead the way in love and people find a way to twist your words and question your motivations, it can really shock you to your core. Uh, and parenthetically, sadly, much of today's discourse, deliberations, and debates have been reduced to sound bites, gifts, and memes that often distort the conversation and move it from civil to being chaotic. The sources that we used to rely on accurate information for, they have grave issues with their integrity. You, you You've got now evangelical Christians who are going out of their way and losing their integrity by espousing the wonderful Christian virtues that Donald Trump seems to have. We have a police union in this city that up to this point passed on endorsing presidential candidates. They passed on Nixon and Carter and Goldwater and Reagan, Dukakis, Bush, Clinton, Gore, Obama, Romney, and McCain and said, we believe that we have found our militaristic champion in 
Donald Trump. What in the world are you doing? This comes at a time when our city is under a national microscope because of how our police department has overused force in black and brown communities. They had always remained neutral because they understood that they've got to protect and serve with the full public trust and now they're willing to forego integrity to send a message to all of us. We have sold our souls and our integrity for a God that finds hate fashionable, capitalism profitable, and nihilism able to sell guns and bullets. You've got keyboard and internet bullies who are able to lie their way into the public space and bait people into becoming just as divisive as they are. The news is no longer interested in reporting information that we need to make good decisions, but they try to create news to compete with the blogs and online publications. I'm going somewhere. And here we are fighting for justice and equality, fighting for love and peace, fighting to let our little light shine. We often have our integrity and our work ethic and our ability questioned at every turn we get. See, every day you get up in black or brown skin, you are under the microscope to show that you are worthy to participate in the freedoms that this nation guarantees you. Every day when you are at school or at work or shopping, the decisions you make somehow represent all of us as a people of faith, all because we just keep living just just keep living the disciple dr luke he tells us in this text that this is paul's perplexing predicament in this encounter that finds him in court facing a sanhedrin trial paul has been arrested because he's aligned his ministry with jesus the christ because he's challenged the status quo and anytime brothers and sisters you start to speak out and take action against systems that oppress and devalue people anytime you try to level the playing field for, for all folks and give everybody access to opportunity and achievement anytime you want to improve the conditions under which people live and work there will be those who benefit from the current system who will do everything they can to discredit you and to challenge your viability and your integrity the religious leaders they looked at Paul and they said he's gonna let Greeks into our club uh, he's going to let in some undesirables, some people that we don't like and we don't want them to be a part of our system. He's going to let them into the club. They, and when they come in, they might come in without the right clothes on. They, they might come in without the proper understanding of how we do business here in, in, in the Sanhedrin. They, they might come in without the proper understanding and might have some new ideas about how we're supposed to operate and do ministry. They might even come into our church talking about we need more Holy Ghost. They, they might come in and want to join the temple choir. They might come in and actually want to change their lives. And we really ain't interested in life change. We, we just come to church because it's fashionable. Because my mom and daddy told me I'm supposed to go. We can't have none of that. This guy Paul is a charlatan. He's an imposter. He needs to be locked up, beaten, and convicted. Help me, Holy Ghost. Can, can, can we park here parenthetically so, so we can provide some sermonic symbolism? The truth is that the power brokers in this society, they were were given authority by those with real power to oppress and vilify their own people. The, the late Dr. Asa Hilliard, who was an eminent psychologist in one of his books entitled The Black Maroon, he, he puts a two-page chapter on the making of a sheepdog, how, how sheepdogs get made. He learned this while watching the Discovery Channel. He said at birth, they take a sheepdog, a German shepherd or a collie, they take it away from the dog litter it was born into and put it in a sheep litter so that it will drink drink the sheep's milk. Here, here's the reasoning he said. They get, they get the sheep's milk into the dog system. They get the sheep's DNA into the dog system. They let it grow up along with that litter. They let the dog play with the sheep. Let it become just like the sheep. And when it gets grown, a dog, if a dog from its own litter, a dog that's a sister or a brother to that dog comes near the sheep, it will attack and kill its sister or brother all to protect the sheep. And if the master comes near threateningly, the dog will kill its own master to protect the sheep. Guess what? If you take us away from the traditions of God's church, if you take us away from the foundations of our faith and put the world's DNA in us, then we will attack our own people. We will attack our own history just to preserve and protect the culture that is contradictory to Jesus the Christ and the culture that has been oppressing you. Help me, Holy Ghost. I, I, I promise you I'll preach out of this in a minute. The Pharisees and Sadducees were given permission by the Roman government 
government to rule over their own brothers and sisters. These were their kinfolk. These were people just like them. They were not even in real control and they didn't have any real power or real authority. They were given the power to wield power over their own people, but they were a part of a system that would not let them fully become a part of the real upwardly mobile economically thriving structure. They were fighting and arguing over land they did not own and dirt that they did not make. In a real sense, they never figured out that they had more people and power together than their oppressor had and that if they had decided to work together, they could inflict positive transformational change on their society. And that's one of our problems right now. We're focused on the wrong enemy. We fight and argue and strive to get things we don't own or develop. We got young brothers and sisters from one neighborhood fighting and killing somebody from another neighborhood and neither one of them own any property in any neighborhood that they're in. Help me, help me Jesus. We, we, we struggle to buy shoes we don't make. We buy jewelry we don't mind, food we don't grow, houses we didn't build and then we get mad at each other, bicker with each other, stifle and stifle each other as if we are each other's enemy. If we ever discover that we have all in the Christian community, in God's church, in the family of God as human beings, that we all have human ingenuity, we all have the creative impulses, we, we got all of the strategic savvy that we need to build our own houses, to create our own banks, to build our own bridges, to farm our own produce, to make our own clothes, to coop our own chickens, and to raise our own hogs, but we never seem to get to the place where we, the, those of us who trust the Christ of faith, where we truly decide to work together. I'm talking about together across racial boundaries and socioeconomic boundaries. If we ever decided to work together, we could build generational stability and upward mobility. We would be spiritually resurrected, economically protected, socially connected, and mentally we will be introspective. But we got to work together. Just, just keep living. Because the problem is there's always a faction that can be picked off and bought off by a little, little title and so some scratch that, that, that can be bought off, a faction that doesn't believe in their own greatness, a faction that is self-deprecating, a faction that thinks that success and smarts are for somebody else, a faction that is skeptical, that has a viable platform but feels no sense of moral responsibility for their words or their actions, lyrics, or public portrayal, so we hinder our growth and smother our advancement. We just keep traveling in quicksand. And see, the problem, the problem is not individual. The problem is systemic. See, you could lose every enemy you think you have and still face hell tomorrow. Because the problem is never limited to a specific person or group of people. It's always bigger than that. The problem is systemic. That's why Paul's testimony was like this. We wrestle not against flesh and, and blood. You, you, you ain't been in your Bible. We, we wrestle not against all what's going on in the world. We, you, you ain't been in your Bible. You get worried because you ain't been in your Bible. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. But, but against principalities and powers, against spiritual wickedness in high play. Help me, Jesus. And, and, and once you understand that, once you understand that, then you can fight against unchecked, inordinate greed without hating on rich folk. You, you can oppose apartheid and racism and sexism without hating racists and sexists. We can fight political haranguing without hating Pat Robertson or Pat Buchanan or Mike Huckabee or Sean Hannity. We can fight poverty without victimizing poor people. And we can fight sin without hating sinners. But we got to battle, as Paul did in the text, with the tools of the word of God. Yeah, we don't want to fight with that. We like to fight with our mouth. We don't like to fight with the word of God. We got to put on the whole armor of God. You got to cover your heart with righteousness, your vulnerability with truth. Cover your movement with peace, your mind with salvation, and your life with faith. And you got to fight by being a living example of the word of God in action. You got to stand knowing that you're more than a conqueror through Jesus. Christ stand knowing that love is what covers a multitude of sin stand knowing that if any man be in Christ he is a new creature stand knowing that no weapon formed against you shall prosper the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but they're mighty in God for the pulling down of all of these strongholds Paul understood that he was fighting against the system and the system demanded that he use different tools 
Ah, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but guess what the scripture says? They are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Uh, keep living, just keep living in the word and under the cross. You gotta, gotta just keep, keep living. But the question I, I hear you asking, I hear you asking from the floor is how do we try to fulfill our collective promise while living uh, in, in trials and temptations and tests and trouble, living with all of this chaos and calamity? How, how is it, how is it that we try to do what God says do? I like, I like the text. Paul gives us one answer and a promise that the first thing is that if you're going to live, if you're just going to keep living, keep living, then you might as well live so you give folks something to talk about. Live, live so you give so folks folk something to talk about. You can write that down. Paul, Paul is in trouble and pleading his case before the Sanhedrin court. See, see, the brothers in the court have been talking about how Paul is stirring people up and setting up churches. Oh, oh, what a bad thing he was doing, trying to help people get their lives together. They're, they're talking about his ministry and his unorthodox methodology. They're talking about him being disrespectful to the elitist and the power brokers in society. They accuse Paul of speaking against the rules and rudiments of their prevailing religious ideology. They questioned his integrity and challenged his authority to do what he was doing. And, and I believe that from the progression of the text that Paul started getting happy. He started to get excited about people talking about him. Yeah, you, you're, doing, you're doing some radical reclamation and redeveloping and recognizance work for Jesus when the folks with perceived power start talking about you. Help me, Holy Ghost. See, the church, the believer the, that, that has swagger. You, If you got spiritual swagger you're gonna have folk talking about you talking about you the church that is caught up though in mundane minutia the church that is only internally focused the church that is stuck in strife and old dogma and antiquated dogmatics doesn't get folks talking about nothing uh, see people rarely talk about people or groups that are no threat to them but, but when they perceive that you have a methodology that may be threatening, when they perceive you got something of value that they want to access or to discredit, you give them something to talk about. Huh? And I don't know, but my exegetical imagination says that maybe it was here when Paul was on trial that he began to consider writing his personal declaration of independence. You know what his personal declaration of independence was? He, he, wrote, he wrote, therefore I take pleasure in my infirmities, uh, in approaches and needs and persecutions and distress and I do it all for Jesus uh, for when I am weak then I really am strong I hear you Paul and, and maybe maybe while standing before the judge it was the foundation was laid for Paul to have that encounter with God where he said I had this thorn in my flesh and prayed three times that God would take it out but one day Jesus told him I'm not going to take it out I can do more for you than just take out that thorn I, I can show you something that you can't see until you learn how to deal with suffering. I, I'm going to lay it, let it stay there so I can bless you by it. I can develop you in it. I can prosper you with it. I can strengthen you for it. I can encourage you through it because my grace is is sufficient so so he was able to trust in the Jesus he met on that Damascus road and find out that every time people are talking about you it's not because you're doing something wrong uh, you're being called today to live so you give folks something to talk about. Live so they have to talk about how much you love the Lord. Live, live. So folks are talking about how much you love your neighbor as yourself. So they talk about how much of a blessing you are. Live so God can use your haters to help you on your journey. If you're sold out for God, then you can live so you give folks something to talk about. And if you're doing justly and loving mercy and folks are talking negatively about you, just know that all they're doing is giving you unpaid advertising. That's all, that's all haters do for you is they give you unpaid advertising. You, you ain't got to pay them to talk about you. They just do it anyway. So, so, so you, you, you who can talk you up to the point that where God opens up opportunities even through your haters. Because they talk so much about you that somebody said, man, this person must be doing something of value. The scripture says he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies he he doesn't take the enemies out of the room to feed me till i want no more the scripture says that when i sit down at god's table there are enemies at the table and god overflows my cup and they gotta watch god 
But guess what else they do? They get to be a part of the residual blessing of God because the overflow from my cup, I got to be so tight with God that I want God to even bless my enemies. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I like, I, I like, I like. Maybe, maybe you you hadn't heard this song, but but I like the song that my my our church mothers and fathers used to sing. They used to sing, "Talk about me as much as you please," but but they said, "The more you talk, I, I'm gonna stay on my knees and in, in prayer." In, in a real sense, if folks are talking about the change in your life, if they're talking about how how much different you are than you used to be, if they're talking about how you're shaking things up on the side of righteousness, if they're talking about how you are offending a corrupt and unfair system at work, if they're talking about how you're being a voice for the victimized, then you know, know that you're keeping good company. Why? Because Jesus was a perfect man and Jesus dwelt the fullness of God bodily, but that didn't keep folk from talking about Jesus. Folk talked about the light of the world. They talked about the lily in the valley and the bright and the morning star. He was hated without a cause. He was rejected without a reason. He was arrested for doing good. He was convicted for being innocent. He was crucified for being light. He was buried for being truth. And he was guarded for being the Savior who delivers us from sin. You got to live so you give folks something to talk about. Uh, there was a guy who served in the administration of Nelson Mandela uh, who could not handle. He, he was from the old, old apartheid system. He was a holdover from the apartheid system. And, and this guy couldn't handle the fact that Nelson Mandela had gotten out of jail and was now the president of South Africa. The guard would never call him Mr. President or President Mandela. He would just call him Mandela, 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 Mandela. And one day, one of the other guards went to President Mandela. Mandela and said, Mr. President, the next time he refers to you as Mandela, I'm going to slap him in his mouth. I'm slap him in his mouth. And President Mandela said, man, you don't have to slap him in his mouth because he may not call me president, but I am the president. He, 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 done, he ain't got to call me president for me to be the president. It's not what folks say about you. It's what you answer to. Just, just keep living in here and love with love in your heart. Keep living with joy in God. Keep living with belief in yourself. Keep living and trust in the Lord. Keep living to challenge injustice, to stamp out ignorance, to tear down racism, to eliminate sexism, to put prison out of business, to overthrow police brutality. Keep living to be You'll pass out of poverty and you'll be living so you give folks something to talk about. But, but, but not, only, not only the promise, the promise is this, not only do you live so you give folks something to talk about, but if you live so you give folks something to talk about, you'll be living so you give God something to smile about. Uh, and I'm done, I promise you. The text for today concludes with Paul being rescued from an angry mob of political leaders by a commander who orders the soldiers to capture Paul for his own good. Paul was dealing with a difficult dilemma. He was dealing in the, with members of the convention or conference, and he offended the chief bishop. You know, you can't, you can't, offend, can't offend the chief, chief bishop. The chief bishop is sensitive. It's sensitive, you got to... You got to make sure you have all your, your ducks in a row when you talk to the chief bishop. You got to know when to stand and when to sit, know when to nod your head and bow. And when you got permission to speak to the chief bishop, the chief bishop's entourage wanted to take Paul out. The, the church folk, instead of praying for Paul, they started praying on Paul. Instead of, instead of getting down and, and, and saying, God, help, help him. They, they started adding to the angry mob and started shouting at him. But, but he handles this mayhem with a focus on God's ministry and mission. He ultimately remembers that the bishops from the two different denominations, they, they had bishops from, from the Baptist church and, and bishops from the Catholic church. They had a disagreement about this matter of the resurrection. And, and so he creatively confronts the haters and the folk who've been talking about him. While Paul is set apart in the solitude of his own solemnity, he's visited by God who tells him, it's going to be all right, Paul. Everything 
everything is going to turn out for the best. You've been a good witness for me here in Jerusalem. Now you're going to be my witness in Rome. See, God is telling Paul, I'm still smiling on you, brother. People will try to assign to you their insecurities. They'll try to demean and devalue your dreams. They might try to find a reason to justify their silly attitude towards you. They might drag your name through the muck and the mud. They might try to make their problem your problem. But you must understand that sometimes things go wrong and people run their mouths not because you're wrong but hold on I don't want you to leave here thinking you're self-righteous don't get too caught up and think you self-righteous but 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 every time people run their mouths you're not wrong but all still do sin and fall short of the glory of God but because you are right and therefore you become a threat to the entrenched evils of this sinful world and when you can address people's treatment of you and they're talking about you without becoming mean-spirited vindictive or hateful you're giving God something to smile about uh, anytime you stand with integrity forgive with impunity promote solidarity and keep pressing through your adversity then you're on your way to living so you give God something to smile about William Shakespeare said sweet are the uses of adversity which like the toad ugly and venomous wears yet a precious jewel on his head uh, when God smiles he gives you provision for his vision when he smiles he makes you a victor over tragedy when you face long odds when you face long periods of waiting for an answer to your prayers uh, when the marriage in getting better when the surgery is necessary when you can't see the steady stream of God's miracles uh, and you still have the ability to tell God uh, even if you don't deliver me uh, I know you're still able uh, then guess what God smiles at you uh, Jeremiah Wright tells this story in his sermon faith under fire about an old song that his daddy used to sing and a lot of our mamas and daddies used to sing this song he said that daddy used to sing I will trust in the Lord uh, he said that his daddy didn't have any form of vocal training uh, but kept on singing I will trust uh, in the Lord uh, he said his daddy's voice uh, was like riding on a gravel road uh, and you could hope he would find a melody along the journey uh, he said his daddy couldn't keep a note uh, or hum a tune uh, but he said why he didn't know the notes uh, daddy knew the Lord uh, and he would sing based on what he knew about the Lord uh, he said through five major surgeries uh, he said daddy kept singing uh, I will trust in the Lord uh, two disc removed from his back uh, and as they wheeled him into the surgery room uh, daddy said I'll trust in the Lord uh, three fourths of his stomach taken out uh, and he shouted I'm a trust in the Lord uh, he passed to the church for 42 years uh, singing I will trust in the Lord uh, all of his life uh, he sing I'll trust in the Lord uh, and if you trust in the Lord uh, no matter your situation uh, if you trust in the Lord uh, when trust is hard to do uh, if you trust in the Lord uh, when trouble shows up uh, if you trust in the Lord Lord, uh, when you're on top of the mountain uh, if you trust in the Lord uh, when you want to get somebody back uh, if you trust in the Lord uh, God will smile on you uh, is there a witness here uh, that will trust in the Lord uh, do I have three friends in here uh, who want to make God smile uh, when you remember uh, that the divine blood of God uh, is cruising through your veins uh, God smiles on you uh, when you love your enemies uh, God smiles on you uh, when you bless them that curse you uh, when you do good to those that hate you uh, when you pray for them that use you, huh? my God smiles. Huh? When you trust in the Lord, huh? when moments become movements, huh? when you remember that no weapon huh? that's formed against you shall prosper, huh? then God smiles on you. Huh? When you remember huh? to make a joyful noise, huh? when you remember that the Lord is your shepherd huh? and you shall not want, huh? when he's your light huh? and your salvation, huh? God smiles. Huh? When God is your source, huh? when God is your strength, huh? when your faith gets stronger, huh? when you rejoice in trouble uh, when you give thanks in everything uh, God smiles on you uh, he smiles uh, and goodness and mercy follow you uh, he smiles uh, and you dwell in his house forever uh, he smiles uh, and he elevates your life uh, you want to live uh, so you give God something to smile about uh, let me park this bus God just wanted wanted me to tell you today just keep just keep living keep living with faith and God will smile on your life uh, he'll smile and heal this nation uh, he'll smile and heal the land uh, he'll smile and forgive our sins uh, he'll smile and hear us from heaven uh, but we got to just keep living with God uh, keep living with unity uh, keep living with harmony uh, keep living with love in your heart uh, keep living with enthusiasm uh, I'm trying to leave you alone uh, and we got to keep living uh, so we can start turning these senseless 
murders uh, that we hear about in our streets, uh, we can start turning these senseless murders uh, into salvific movements. Uh, every day we keep reading uh, about more and more senseless murder. Uh, we hear about young blood uh, being shed on our streets. Uh, that's senseless murder. Uh, we hear about the overuse of force uh, by some police officers. Uh, that's senseless murder. Uh, we hear about neighborhood shootings uh, and folk and gangs getting retaliation. Uh, that's senseless murder. Uh, we read about violence and victims uh, and people looking for vindication. Uh, that's senseless murders. Uh, we read about senseless murders, uh, but our charge uh, is to just keep living uh, so God can transform senseless murders uh, into salvific movements. Uh, what are you talking about, crazy pastor? Uh, you do know that the church of Jesus uh, was born out of a senseless murder. Uh, my Bible says uh, that there was a 33-year-old uh, from the wrong side of Nazareth's tracks. Uh, he was not afforded due process uh, along his journey. Uh, they interrogated him uh, without an attorney present. Uh, they convicted Jesus uh, without any real charges. Uh, the video evidence showed uh, that they beat him and he had done no wrong. Uh, the evidence showed uh, that they stole his clothes. Uh, the judge and the jury uh, found Jesus guilty. Uh, so he died on Friday. Uh, a senseless murder. Uh, he was dead on Saturday. Uh, a senseless murder. Uh, but my Bible says uh, that early, uh, and I mean early, uh, on Sunday morning, uh, he got up uh, to lead a salvific movement. Uh, so just keep living. Uh, Cause my God, uh, I said my God uh, specializes uh, in turning tragedy uh, into triumph. Uh, he turns hell uh, into hallelujah. Uh, he turns sadness uh, into joy. Uh, is there anybody here uh, that knows that Jesus is all right? Uh, are you glad uh, that Jesus is all right? Uh, are you glad uh, that living he loved you uh, and dying he saved you? Uh, buried he carried uh, your sins far away. Uh, and you were the rise and he justified. Uh, freed me forever. Uh, and one day, uh, I said one day, uh, he's coming back. Uh, and that's a glorious day. Uh, do I have a witness here uh, that's glad that Jesus uh, is all right? Uh, somebody in the back, uh, they used to say, what's the matter with Jesus uh, and somebody would holler uh, he's all right uh, he's all right uh, say yes uh, yeah he's all right he's all right he's all right just keep living live so you give folks something to talk about and you'll be living so you give God something to smile about God can turn deserts of depression into oases of opportunity but the people of faith those of us who know the love of Jesus whose lives have been touched and changed by Jesus we gotta just keep living stand with me all over god's house